G'day guys, Cam from Battler back with you again. Um, as promised, we're going to have a look at this uh, swing extender. I'm out of my good mate John's workshop this morning because uh, this is where I got the concept from uh, a couple of years ago. I think it was about five years ago I think you showed this on. It would have been close to five years ago. But I came out and saw that setup that you did for us. So. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is where I got the concept from. So I thought I'd show you where it actually started from. Um, John's going to put it together for us and uh, and uh, we'll see how it looks and uh, maybe give some, uh, some some of you guys some ideas on how you can modify your lathe to do what, uh, what John's done here. So as I said, he's just got the three and a half inch swing Myford and uh, I think we're talking, you, you can swing up to nearly 12 inches with this extender. Those those fly pl or fly wheels you did, you had to take two inches off the top of those, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I did. And I think they ended up about nine inches at the end. Of them anyway, it's pretty close to it. So, this little, uh, this little jig's got quite a lot of capacity on it. Yeah, 12 inches. Mm. So that's the, that's the face plate that John sets up and it's 12 inches. So he can, he can turn 12 inches in this uh, little three and a half inch Myford. So we'll, uh, we'll, set that, uh, we'll set that up and see where we go. And another thing I want to show you guys too is some of the work that, that John's done uh, in his model making. And uh, honestly, I, I just shake my head and think, <laughs> how do you do it? Oh gosh, I'm so far off the mark. I remember to be yak about when I first bumped into you, John, I would have been five or six years old. Yeah, yeah. And, and you bet that and you were building the Virginia and Dad was doing the nine F evening star, I think, right. at that stage. Yeah. So that was when you're up in Fairview Avenue there. And uh, John's now out on a beautiful property out here in the country and um, you know, that garden out there is absolutely magnificent. I think it's Jean's work, isn't it? <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> Mostly Jean's work. I'll cut it's it's beautiful anyway. So look we'll uh, well, actually, what we might do is I'll, we'll show this um, the uh, the little uh, engine that you'd made that I saw the flywheels on. Yeah. We might show a few of the other engines, and we'll come back and show the setup. How does that sound? Yeah, all right. All right. Okay. We'll do that. So this is the engine that uh, that John made up, and um, this is where I got the idea from the the flywheel working out how on earth he, he machined this in that uh, in that small three and a half inch uh, swing lathe. So um, that's the extender to use for this. So we'll show you this and. You're saying, John, the model we're going to look at in a minute, this is your 21st model you've built. The yeah. One, yeah, out there, 20, 21 models, and the standard on them is just unbelievable. And look, I remember when you first started running this, this is the one that, that, you, that you ran on diesel. Originally? No, the single cylinder? No, nah, nah, yeah, that was the single cylinder one that you're running on diesel, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. But um, yeah, the smell of fish and chips. Well, that was the oil or the, the fuel that you got from Graham, wasn't it? Right, yeah. Graham and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a good mate of ours, Graham, um, distills his own uh, his own diesel and his uh, and his Tardis machine. I think he does nearly two hundred liters uh, in forty eight hours. I think he can put through that thing. Oh, Unbelievable. I think it's about thirty two cents a liter he does it for. <laughs> but he includes all his power and all his chemicals and everything that goes with it. So, but uh, that's what I first saw. We might have a look at that um, the radial and the king that you've also done, John. If that's all right, mate. So this is just some of John's uh, John's engines. This is the one I can remember running on the diesel that uh, that made the place smell like uh, fish and chip oil. But gosh, it ran smoothly. Absolutely beautiful. So this is a nine-cylinder radial, John. Rosary. Uh, Rosary. Yeah. Rosary. Rosary. Sorry. Mm. Beautiful. And there's the eighteen cylinder that you've got in there. Jeez, mate. I mean. This workmanship is just unbelievable. And not only is into the little internal combustion engines, but we'll have a look at this magnificent uh, four-cylinder King that, uh, that he's made in five and five inch gauge, mate. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd love to show the viewers that Merlin that you've done. So this is the four-cylinder King that John's made. And I'll tell you what, if you're a rivet counter, you'd be in heaven with, with this unit. So you said you started this in, was it 75, John? Yeah. Around about 1975. Because I've ridden behind this when you've, because you've got your track outside there on the property and uh, it's just got a magnificent peak to it. So there you go guys, this is what you can do when you retire. <laughs> oh gosh. 
Let's go and have a look at that uh, that Merlin and the little freelance. Okay, guys, so this is the the Merlin that, that John's put together. And unfortunately, this is like an iceberg. You you only see a a poofed length of, of uh, the actual workmanship on the outside. What what is inside this is just magnificent, absolute clockwork stuff. And it's got such a beautiful note. I, I think you've got one of these. You've got this on YouTube, haven't you, John? I have. I think so. I might uh, I might put a link up for this one. It's, uh, Oh, it's Royce Merlin. Were these the castings that came out of Germany, John? No, America. They were America, were they? Okay. I don't think they're producing them anymore, are they? No, they're finished. They're finished with these, but... Because Mike's doing one as well. Uh, Mike's giving up on it. Is he? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll give up on it too, John. Oh, gosh. That is just a work of art. Beautiful. And uh, this is the, well, this is the freelance you've just finished. This is the 21st, uh, the 21st one, isn't it, John? Uh, yes, this is right. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, okay, Jane, how are you? Oh, good. Are you going to have a cup of John? Yeah. Right. Well, how about we fire this one up? We'll come in no. for a cup of them. All right. No worries. All right, mate. Well, do you want to give her a kick over? I'll... Get up nice and personal with it and just show some of that detail that you've got on this. Beautiful. Oh, I'll come around the back, mate. I can remember when uh, when when Peter fired his radio up, John, and Dave was standing behind it. And he just he just got covered in oil when he yeah. fired up his radio. That's the oil over the door that one too. <laughs> Probably all over me too, mate. Rosie's going to have a fit if I get home. <laughs> it's all over the lens. I'll need to clean that up a bit, I think. Yeah, Beautiful. Oh, magnificent, John. One of the joys living out in the country, John. You got a view like this, mate. Oh, straight out of the workshop, mate. <laughs> this is beautiful. Right down the back there is where, uh, where John's got his track. So this is your drive gear. So is this roughly a two to one ratio, John? Looks all. Not at all? I can't be talking about it. Yeah, yeah. So it just uh, sits up on your Morse 2 taper in your nose. So this here's the magic. So it just locates in between your bed there, mate. The 
fiddly bit. <laughs> Oh yeah, put me first, that's a shot. Obviously, because we've raised the centre height, we need to put a uh, an extender up for the uh, for the top slide. It just mounts in your saddle, John. Oh, yeah, get your two slots lined up, yeah. Yeah, that's nice. on, that brings up your new centre height, which is ideal. That's just a standard uh, nose um, thread for your, uh, for your standard chucks, same as what you've got on your uh, nose of your knife. That is beautiful. So that's the concept for uh, for increasing the swing on your uh, on your load. So very very simple. Great little project to build. So if you want to increase the uh, the capacity of your uh, of your of your lines, this is uh, this is the jig that does it for you. So um, I'll get back to my workshop and uh, I'll probably show you this thing on steroids. It's uh, it's a lot lot bigger. It's, uh, yeah, it's just so simple. And John, you were saying you, you saw this in the back of one of the uh, modelling magazines many, many years ago. Yeah. And just sort of designed up the concept from what you saw in the, in the photos. That's So in case we did miss, I wasn't sure whether I was recording, but uh, we've got a um, an extension we put up here for the, uh, for the top side to bring it up to the uh, up to the higher centre. That's beautiful, John. Just beautiful. Uh, project John is working on. Doug Kelly's twin cylinder opposed piston engine so he started doing his little tiny helical gears which he uh, he actually hobs these doing the cranks. So, absolutely beautiful work. Yeah John I've got to retire mate. <laughs> Your time, will, your time will come. Don't wish you luck. Yeah. Good day, guys. Cam from Butler again, back here in uh, in my workshop. Um, hope you enjoyed a look at, uh, at Johnny's uh, Johnny's workshop and, and what he does, especially those models. Um, just absolutely phenomenal the stuff that, uh, that he does and uh, the quality when I mean, he does the uh, the manufacturing, all those little tiny components to make up those engines is just incredible and. Uh, his uh, sense of feel for doing that sort of work and uh, it's something that you only hone over many years. As a matter of fact, Johnny used to work um, as a toolmaker with uh, with Brown and Sharp over in England 
uh, back in the 60s, 70s, um, before he migrated out here. And um, as a tool maker, it certainly shows and, and the type of work that he does. So I hope you enjoyed that little visit out there. Um, not often I catch up with John out of his own house. He's, uh, I caught up with him a couple of weeks ago, but uh, he's out in the sticks a fair bit, so it's a bit of a drive to get out there, but uh, certainly worth it when you go out there. All right, um, actually what John did give me was, uh, I borrowed this off him, this uh, lathe swing extender that, that he's made up, so I'll do a heap of stills of this, and um, I'll get them up after this video, so you can have a bit of a look at how it all goes, and what I might even do is, um, I'll strip it down, do some drawings, and uh, we'll make the base fairly flexible that you can use to, to max your own your own lathe bed, and uh, give you the opportunity to maybe make up some of that for yourself. All right, so I've done my lathe extender, and uh, my mates seem to think it's uh, it's Johnny's arrangement put on steroids, because uh, yeah, it's quite large and uh, very much oversized. So um, we'll, uh, We'll show it to you, I'll lift it up in the, in the plate here. It's been quite some time since I've actually, <laughs> I've actually put this on the lathe, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit. So, I guess, uh, hopefully it counts, it's a little bit in frame there, so that's, uh, that's my arrangement. Pop in there and have a look at the gearing a little bit later on. But as I said, I've, I've got mine sitting in around about a two to one ratio. So I've got a larger bull gear here. I have a an idler gear, which is uh, made out of nylatron, uh, which basically reverses the direction for me with the gear sets uh, with Johnny's arrangement. You have to run the lathe in reverse to, to cut normally. Um, with having the idler in there, it actually reverses the gear direction. So you don't have to worry about trying to run the machine backwards. So, but uh, at the end of uh, the put together, um, I'll take this down, take the guards off, and uh, we'll have a we'll have a closer look through it. But that's how she looks. All right, before we start, I've got uh, some gear that we need to put on first. So I'll just reset the camera. I'll leave that sitting up there, and uh, yeah, we'll have a look at that first. <laughs> So these are one of these D14 adapters that, uh, that I've machined up with the pin so I could mount a small pinning gear that I, uh, that I machined up. So it's very handy to be able to cut your own nose tapers to be able to do these sorts of little adapters. When I first started running this I actually had this gear mounted in my three jaw chuck. But because I've only got a short bed lathe, I think it's about 800 by 20 centers, I, I needed to suck it back as far as I could. So, make up an adapter, being able to make that a lot, lot shorter, get a little bit more bed length to work with. And these gears, I cut these using the old, uh, I call these the brown and sharp um, cutters for, uh, for gear cutting. So I got those off. Uh, I think it was CTC at that stage, I think it was, and you know, dirt cheap, so I bought the two for the different uh, numbers of teeth. And uh, machined them up with a horizontal attachment on the uh, on the bridge port. I'll give that a clean down, and then we'll zoom you back out, and we'll get the uh, the actual extender mounted up into place for you and see, uh, see how that all looks. All right, let's bring this into place. Let's 
a bit of light lubricant so that it uh, slides over. I'm going to get it set in place. Just use the um, the lock for the uh, for the fixed steady. Um, just lock it up underneath, just with the draw bolt down. This is a bit of a fiddle to get this, so I, I do need to make one up and tap it. Make it a little bit uh, easier to work with. chain block. It's a, it's a little uh, 250 kilogram um, chain block rather than using the electric hoist. I find the electric hoist on fine movements it's pretty coarse and uh, it tends to thump into the bed a little bit with the flex that's in the bridge so um, the chain block gives me much better control to get this down nice and comfortably on the bed without thumping the thing around too much. So uh, you know, the bulk of all the things done with the electric hoist but the fine adjusting final positioning I do with the uh, the chain hoist. This is the sort of thing you couldn't do unless you had decent lifting gear in your workshop. Let me get to the side stuff. So that's the extender bit into place. The next thing we need to do is because we've changed the center height, as you can see quite considerably, uh, we need to be able to lift this up as well. And there's a couple of different arrangements that I've had to put on this extender here to allow it to face all the way in because basically over 700 millimeters to face in, I've got 350, 350, which is around about the stroke I've got on this side. So um, I've got two positions that I need to set that top slide into. So um, I'll get set up and uh, we'll get that into place for you. Right, um, what I've done to my saddle to be able to mount that extender onto, I've actually drilled and tapped a series of holes into the uh, into the top of this. And when I'm not using this, this arrangement, I've, I've just got some rub screws that I use to plug it off just to stop the swarf getting down um, inside those holes. And this is really handy because I've got a number of other adapters that I can actually mount onto this. I'd love to have one of these with the, with the T-slots like you see with the uh, like, like the Myfords or some of the Herkuses. Just makes it so much more flexible. It's uh, really nerve-wracking when you're actually, <laughs> actually drilling into something like this that's uh, that's so good. You sort of worry about whether you're going to stuff it up. But, um, yeah, it all worked out well in the end. Let's 
Let's do that. Right. We'll back you up and uh, we'll get this into place. Underneath here, I've actually machined this as a lip so that that edge there locates up against the edge of the uh, of the saddle. So there's no way it's going to be able to be forced that way when I'm uh, when I've actually got a cut on. screw to the top of it, just so I don't lose the things. What we're doing today, I'm not going to screw all these in. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six that I located in with. Plus I've got the spigot on the uh, on the end for the top slide. So look. I'll just put them in loose and, uh, and we'll leave it at that. Take this off. Well, no, I'll zoom you up a little bit closer. We can have a look at this arrangement here and, and how this, uh, this actually works. So what this is, it's actually a, a direct mimic of what I've got on the saddle to be able to fit the, um, the top slide onto. Got that top slide. A bit of a wipe before we bring up there. So once again, I've just made the little keys that uh, that man in there that uh, she's going to locate onto. And before I do take that off, as I did mention, I can actually move this to two separate locations. As I said on my uh, stroke on the saddle isn't enough to cover a full 700mm face cut so I do have to do two separate positions but look a lot of the work you're not going to be doing a, a complete face cut unless I was doing like the, um, the face plate but um, I can set that up in two different positions depending on where I need the machine so here you go coach directly into there now for really, really large stuff where I want to turn an OD, I've actually, I'll show you what we do there. So for larger stuff, I've got this right hand boring bar that I put in. And actually see from the photos I put up at the end of this, you'll actually see this in action doing, uh, doing the OD turning. So, you know, you can set this up and turn quite a fair ways with that. Quite a fair way. So that works really, really well. Works really well. And you'd be surprised how robust this setup is. I was taking um, three millimeter cuts on intermittent cuts um, on some of the weld joints on that face plate that I uh, that I machined up, and uh, it, it didn't have any problems whatsoever. Now I thought maybe it's going to be stretching the machine a little bit, but it worked beautifully, it cut like an absolute dream, so I was very, very happy with it. This is very heavy. You want to reduce vibration, get some mass behind you. Um, so this extension is very heavy, adds a lot more mass to this cutting area. It takes out any vibration that you may have and makes the whole show so much more rigid. So this particular case, yep, I've gone with, uh, I've gone with mass. Well, what we might do now is I'll, I'll take the, uh, this four jaw off, this 350mm diameter four jaw, and uh, 
I'll set the face plate, and I haven't had this face plate up for a good couple of years, so I'd be interested to see how it actually clocks up to see if there's uh, there's been any any uh, relieving or movement um, since I've machined this, because uh, I did have it fully I did have it fully stress relieved before I did do uh, do all the machining on it. So we'll uh, we'll get this off. I'll show you this thing coming off, and um, we'll uh, we'll get that face plate up for you. Right, so this is um, one of the D16 tapers that, uh, that this is actually fixed onto. So, I'm going to put a bit of it before I take the last one out, or it's going to be a bit messy. I've got that, uh, that chuck off, so I thought I'd show you what that D16 adapter is that I've made up to fit onto the nose, nose of the spindle. And I notice with anything I do, where it's a very neat, tight fit, I always put jacking screws so that if anything needs to come off, you can jack it off very, very easily without having to get into it with, uh, with hammers. Notice too that I've actually made up matching way grooves to match in there. I've done them what I call cartridge design, where it's an insert that uh, the bolts in there, so it gets machined up separately. Uh, once the datum points are known, um, then you can uh, you can do your final cuts. This side here, he sits on the prism. He sits on the flat. These bearing blocks, I've got the um, Timken taper rollers inside these with the, um, with the nut and the locking washer just to uh, set the, uh, the tension uh, on this. When I made up the, um, the idler gear first, I did it out of steel, but Spur gears being what spur gears are, they certainly uh, ring and make a make a bit of a racket. So the idler gear now I've made up out of uh, nylatron, which is uh, a fibre mixed into the nylon to uh, to give it strength, and uh, have not had any issues with that at all. But that was the idler that I uh, originally machined up for it. And in the photos at the back of this, um, you'll see the build photos. You'll actually see everything with the uh, with the guards off. You can get a good look at what the uh, what the gear train looks like. All right, so here's the back end of that um, that faceplate that I've made up. And I must apologise, it's not a D16, it's a, it's a D18 taper that I've machined onto these. So, um, yeah. Um, as you can see, this is a separate insert that I've done the machining for that D18, and that bolts into a register that I've machined into the um, into the faceplate itself. And I think I've got some photos of that you'll see at the uh, the end of this with the with the actual build. We'll put them together. All right, we'll set it up and uh, and we'll get it mounted into place, and then uh, we'll turn it over. And I'll be very interested to see uh, if there's any run in it. All right, As with a lot of things I'm assuming where they need to go back together the same way, I always witness to make sure that they're matched when they go back to uh, back together again. It's funny, I was looking through all my old records, all my own drawings with the dates and all this sort of work I did, this unit here, the slotting head, all the lining that I did on my, uh, on my workshop, I, I looked back to see how on earth I found the time and <laughs> A lot of it was actually when I was made redundant and had a, a bit of time off. I did when I was made redundant. I was offered well, a multitude of work to take my pick. And 
but uh, I elected to have some time off before I, before I started again. And as it, as it turned out, I ended up setting up my own business, which was quite successful. But uh, since then, I've moved on again. All right, I'll get that down, we'll nip up the rest of these, and uh, we'll have a look and see how, gosh, I guess how uh, straight it all is. Right, before we check this for running, I might give it a bit of a clean up. I use a, a woolen lanolin that I spray over a lot of my machine tools if I'm not using them too often just to protect them from uh, from rust. But I'll just I'll do a couple of checks. We'll do one on the uh, on the face here. I'll do one on the OD. And look, if any of these are out, what we might do is I might um, I might actually give it a lick, give it a clean up, so you can actually see it in, in operation. Also, we'll one right in the middle here as well. Right. What I'll do is I'll bring you in a little bit closer. So you can actually see what the dial's reading, and I can see what the dial's reading too, so. Right, uh, we'll, we'll bring that in so you can see it. Let's just have a look. See what we're reading here. We'll, we'll bring it onto the zero. That's pretty close. Let's see what the inner edge is reading. So that's virtually reading. Oh, there might be maybe a quarter of a thou, if that. All right, let's bring it out to the outer edge. We'll just reset the camera. not too bad that's just a tad under a thou so running zero zero and on the interface and just a tad over a thou on that outer, outer face let's just see what the OD run out is like well, hopefully you can see that camera angle let's move this in put that on zero and we'll see how we're looking there Hmm. Let's move around a fair bit. Let's tighten it up a little bit. Let's try it again. Only about six there, yeah. Mm. Well, what I might do is, uh, is I might set up and we'll just give that a lick, very light lick on the OD, just to bring that back to spec. So, about six there. All right, so I might set up and. Uh, so we'll, we'll see it in action. Right, so we've got everything bolted down. We've got the extension bolted down, top slides on and bolted down, got the tooling. One of the things I need to do is, is adjust this VFT. Now, with this large amount of mass that I've got to uh, get up and going, 
it does put a huge strain, particularly on the headstock gear sets. So I need to set an acceleration set uh, rate for this uh, faceplate to ramp up to, or this gear to ramp up to. And once again, when you start getting some heavier gear bolted onto the big chucks or the faceplate, that inertia that you've got to overcome obviously increases dramatically. So um, this lathe wasn't designed to do this type of work, so we've just got to make it a little bit softer and give it a little bit of a, uh, a kick on. So I'll just go into the program set. And it is number 14. I'll double that up to 20. We'll set that at that. that come. Right, I'll, uh, I'll reset the camera up and uh, get a decent angle of this so that you can actually see it being machined. Something I wasn't expecting to do today. But um, anyway, we might as well move right, Hopefully you can see that all right. So we're running at roughly 85 RPM. And we're running at around about, uh, what are we looking at? Just a tad shy of 0.4 of a mil per rev in the feed rate. So let's see how that feels. We might soften that feed rate off a little bit, but we'll just see how that feels. All right. You can see that ramp up. You can feel that ramp up that's going on there. Check and make sure I'm not going to hit anything on the way out. That's okay. That's okay. I might just keep that around at a little bit more of an angle. We can. So I've got enough room to bring that out. Oh, we're just off. Just kick the tool ever so slightly back. Just want to have a little bit of clearance on that when we're running it. Alright. I'll just make sure I'm not gonna hit anything when we run that out. Do okay. Oh yeah. which is about 4 thumb, just see how that feels. There's your triggers. Yeah, that's miles too coarse. Let's back it right off.
Well, that ran very consistently all the way along. Obviously, the machine's a little bit differently where the weld is. So I'll get on with a bit of emery paper and just give that a bit of a, a bit of a clean up. But the cut was very consistent all the way along on that. As you can see, that's that's cleaned up really, really, really well. I'm happy with that. Really well. All right, so I'll just flick that on. Just give it a very low rev and just go over with some emery cloth and uh, I'll tidy that up and then I'll I'll give it a respray. All right, guys. Just as a wrap up, I thought I'd quickly show you the. Um, well, some of the drawing that I've done on this to uh, to put this together. Um, that's the the final iteration, if you like. Uh, that's the sectional arrangement, showing uh, showing those Timken bearing sets in their bearing housings. Um, I like to, as part of design work, to locate everything very precisely, so that if it ever comes apart again, it goes together very very easily. And if you're ever a fitter working in really, really tight spots, you, you hope the guy designing this or putting this together has actually thought about you when you've actually got to work on this. Just a standard uh, nut on the back there. I've just put a dummy um, seal bush in there uh, just to push up against to, uh, to set that uh, clearance uh, quite comfortably on those Timken bearings. Um, I've done these as being oil filled, so they're permanently lubricated, uh, filled with oil, uh, with a level um, screw on the edge so that uh, I don't overfill them. Um, makes it easier if you've ever got a greaser who's filling up gearboxes and stuff like that, if you give them an indication as to how high you want that level. Um, that's the adapter we did, the D14 adapter onto the pinion gear, uh, onto the idler gear, which is bearing mounted. Uh, basically, I left that as a floater um, mounted in the block. Um, that I could bring into place, set the clearances that I wanted on the gear sets, mark the holes and then drill and tap and fit it. So that was left as a floater to get um, everything set up precisely with the gearing set. Then onto the bull gear and obviously through the bull gear onto the nose. So that's the arrangement there for the nose showing that D18 taper, uh, how the adapters fit onto the nose piece and I've done these sectionally if you like or what I call cartridge design it just makes it easier um, if I am machining it in my own workshop and I stuff up one part of it it's not a complete throwaway so it's not a great, of ex uh, great deal of extra effort to do it that way for me and then I just detail that through but this is where I start basically I treat this like a like a pallet and I start throwing my ideas down, I look at what my clearance sets are, I look at where my clashes are, get my ideas down. So whether you do it on a screen or whether you do it on a piece of paper and pencil, it's always a good idea to give yourself a bit of a map to follow, a bit of an idea where you're going to go. And um, as you start developing that and working it, um, I throw the ideas off to one side, so I end up with these very large snail trails and stuff sort of thrown all over the screen. But uh, there are ideas that I thought of, I might be able to nip that back later on, but just slowly work it through and then you come up with your, your final iteration that, uh, that you're comfortable with. And then once you're comfortable with that, I then start, um, start detailing all the major components. Now you certainly don't do this professionally in this manner, but uh, at home this is just the way I work. I like to get my ideas down quick and like to work the problems uh, and, and come up with those solutions. So, a lot of the design work you find is very multifaceted. Uh, it's got a number of dimensions to it that you need to keep in, the, in your mind while you're working those problems and try and pull everything together. So, just the bearing caps, shafts, all the gear sets. Um, I always do. Whenever I'm drafting, I'll, I'll do a separate set of sheets, sheets for uh, DXF files for laser cutting. Uh, makes it so much easier for the fabricator if he's got that uh, if he's got that on hand. Back to that GA, and then uh, that was the uh, the saddle extension there. So once again, detailed up. Uh, 
work through it. This one was a fairly simple one, how I was going to rip it out, how I was going to get to weld it. A little extension on top, the top slide uh, um, mounting block if you like. And then once again I, I do the separate little sheet with all the DXF files uh, that goes off to the laser cutter. So I hope that helps somebody out if, uh, if you ever want to go ahead and sort of make something like this. Uh, just whatever you imagine you can you can do. Um, there's, uh, there's no problem that can't be overcome in one way or another. I've, I've certainly found that over many years. And as I said, that other uh, smaller one that I got from Johnny's, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll strip that down and uh, I'll draw that up, measure it up and uh, draw it up and a, get a set of drawings out. Alright, thanks for watching and uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Alright guys, well that's the, uh, the lathe extender that uh, everyone's been waiting on, so I uh, hope you enjoyed that and I uh, hope it's given some, uh, some people a bit of inspiration. If, if you have an imagination, um, you can design anything, you can, you can overcome any problems as long as you have that imagination and that spark to, uh, to overcome a problem or, or, um, or, or um, come up with a solution for something. So don't be put off with... Uh, with things that you think are impossible, they're, they're not. You just have to try a little bit. Um, as I said, I'll put some stills up of the build of that particular that particular unit. Um, and I'll put some stills up of, of Johnny's unit. And as I said, I'll, I'll do a strip down of this and I'll, I'll put some drawings together. No promises to when that'll come out. I'm, I've got a very, very heavy workload at work at the moment. And I've got some, um, some customer work that I've got to do here in the shop as well. So, uh, very busy month to two months for me coming up, unfortunately. Um, the next big project I want to have a look at is I've just about completed all of the detail sheets and assembly drawings, just doing the sectional arrangements now for that, um, that lathe mounted slotter head, the, the powered slotter head. So that's a build that I want to do in here. So uh, I've almost completed the drawings, so I think I'll make that the next project. And um, you can follow along with that. Uh, as we build it and once again um, I'll do something with those drawings as well for anyone who might want to get their hands on it to, uh, to have a look but we'll build it first see how it works and then we'll uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do about drawings for you well thanks for watching and uh, and we'll see you soon